girls, young girls, is kind of the first step in paving the way for female leadership in sport. But what's being done when those girls grow into women, when they move into the workplace, when they, you know, hit the professional pitch court field for the first time? Who's advocating for them? So to improve gender balance in the boardroom, it's not only up to the women in positions of power to push for leadership for females. Men also have a major role to play in moving the needle and creating opportunities for female leadership in sport. And in a male-dominated world, what can men do to be agents of change and to be advocates for females and for female leadership in not only the sports industry, but in the world at large. So that kind of sets us up for our final panel of the summit. So I'm excited to uh, announce our panelists for Finding Male Champions, the role of men in promoting female leadership in sports. So I'd like to welcome Christine Franklin, Executive Vice President Octagon, as our moderator. Uh, we will also welcome David Haggerty, President International Tennis Federation via video as well as Mark Riccio, CEO U.S. Lacrosse and SEGA American Advisory Board member, Michael Rubishaw, Senior Vice President Global Sponsorship MasterCard, and Rick Gotham, welcome, Team President, Boston Celtics. Rich, you can uh, have a seat. We'll get you another Thanks. seat, Rich. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I can stand. No, we got you a chair. Well, no worries. Hi. Hey, everyone. There we we'll go. fill a little right. small amount of time if you can. Thank you. That. There we go. We're just here, male championing our chairs. Bring your own chair. Yep, bring it, B-Y-O-C. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hi. Hi, guys. I think we have, hello, David. Welcome virtually. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Great. Um, just wanted to say hello to everybody. This is the last panel, um, last but not least at all. Um, Maybe least. We're going to be <laughs> we're going to be talking about male champions today, and obviously the the group that we have here um, would not be up here if we didn't already think they were male champions. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're also going to talk about a little bit about how they're helping sports organizations progress being male champions and also being championing of women. So that's a really important part of this. So I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed panelists and have them do a quick 30 second intro about themselves and a little bit about their careers. I think you'll, they can probably go on and on about their successes and their long resumes, um, but uh, I'm giving them a time limit, 30 seconds. David, I'm going to start with you. Well, probably a bad decision, but here I go. Um, <laughs> president of the International Tennis Federation, I'm an IOC member um, and a United Nations he for she champion. Um, my, my life has been mostly sports, tennis, uh, ski, uh, a little bit of golf as well uh, through the years. So thank you for having me on the panel today. Thanks for joining us. Mark, do you want to? Sure. Uh, Mark Riccio, CEO of USA Lacrosse. We're the governing body for the sport uh, in the U.S. My career prior to this was uh, a bit in the agency world, working with an intellectual property law firm and agency. Then I spent some time in venture capital and consulting. Prior to that, I worked at uh, Lagadair, which was a global agency, which is now Sport 5. And then prior to that, a uh, long time uh, at the New York Jets, and then also a few years on the collegiate side. Um, so I've got that background as well. Can I turn it over to you, Rich? Sure. I'm Rich Gotham, president of the Boston Celtics. I've been in that role since about 2007. I've been with the Celtics since 2003. Um, I joined the Celtics after a 15-year career in the internet business. Um, I'm a uh, proud uh, father of three, two of whom are daughters in their early 20s getting their career started. And uh, so I'm happy to be participating in, in something like this and representing. Michael Robichaud. I work in our sponsorships at MasterCard. I actually started out as an engineer. I did that for five years and then went back to school realizing engineering wasn't as fun and uh, went to, uh, moved over to Nextel and I kind of moved around there for a while before I landed in sports, then jumped over to MasterCard where it's been great. Uh, big reason one I wanted to go is uh, you know, work on something like Priceless but also the international work and the global side. So I've been doing that now for quite a while. So a bunch of diverse stuff within that. So it's a lot of fun. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, so I'm just going to pause for a second here and maybe ask one question. 
Um, when we talk about male ambassadors or male man ambassadors, sometimes we call them man ambassadors. Um, those women call that call you guys that secretly. Yeah, that's a secret secret term. Um, but our male ambassadors, you know, when you think of being a male champion, what does it mean to you? I'm going to start with Rich. You talked a little bit about your daughters, but obviously in the workplace, you have to champion women. How, what do you think about that? Or do you think about it at all? Uh, for, for a long time, I didn't think about it at all. When I was probably younger and on my way up, even if I had positions of responsibility where I was managing a lot of people and could influence people's careers, I candidly never differentiated between a woman's view of the world and a man's view of the world in the workplace just didn't really occur to me. And I guess it's a part of your life where you're a little bit kind of driven forward and maybe not as you know aware of what's going on around you. And I was always a person who's very focused on results. And even though I've always felt like I have some degree of emotional intelligence when it came to work, it wasn't really what I thought was 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 a sort of the the most important part of my role as a leader. And over, over the years, I've found it, it is, and I've grown to understand that women have a different experience in the workplace than men. And if you don't understand that, you, you can't get the most out of those women. You can't help them be successful. Um, and, and so I, I've understood that for a while. But I honestly would say in the last two years, the, the world has changed a lot. I think we've all had uh, an opportunity to become more introspective. And I've, and you know, the word intentional, you know, it's a buzzword, it's probably been used a thousand times, you know, over the last couple of days, but I, I think that's, to me, the key to empowering is to be thoughtful, intentional, aware, and understanding that uh, women in the workplace have a different set of needs, a different experience than men, and you have to be aware of that and conscious of that and manage to that. Michael? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned the engineering part because that's not a world you, you walk into and see, a, uh, you know, work with a bunch of women. And I, uh, when I started at Nextel and found myself in marketing and, you know, basically more than half of my bosses have been women. And when you join marketing departments, one of the first things I noticed, wow, I'm working with a lot of women. And I kind of noticed, kind of didn't. Um, I had a great first boss and, and she just uh, taught me just life things, like or work things, and it was. Uh, I think she, as I've gone back and realized, she had a, a better sense of sort of helping me as young and helping me um, kind of put me out there and also challenge me. It was no, it was, it was, the nurturing part wasn't always a, a, a hug. It was usually, uh, well, this is yours. You have to own it and you have to do it. And it wasn't until later. And I always appreciated it from kind of a career, and you you helped me at that point. But I didn't look back later and realize the differences of how maybe I would approach things and how she did. Um, but then as work gone on, you know, look at, we've talked about it, you've heard about MasterCard a lot this last few days, but really we started 10 plus years ago with this whole notion of inclusion and this whole notion of it started geographically, then it was, um, then it was culturally, then it, it really just, the, the definition kept growing and growing and growing. And I'm an only child, he even said only children should be felt inclusive, so I was laughed about that. But, um, but this, this, this get, getting talked about, so... I think the part that uh, I had to become more aware of, and you've met some people that I work with, is um, just to be more thoughtful about it. I know, like you said, we use the word intentional, but just to be able to say, well, how should I think about this? How do you think about this? Is there a different way to think about it? Um, you know, we, we have, we're obviously talking about women, but there's a lot of diversity that, that we're working with, and especially when you leave the country and globally in Asia and other places, the definition is a very broad definition, depending on what you're working on. I've learned a lot of new sports. It was, it was great hearing about rugby. Um, that's a sport that historically was not very inclusive, um, and it's changed a lot and evolved a lot. So I think when it comes to work, it's just sitting there, um, just being curious and being open to um, different points of view and open to being you know, corrected or, or you know, just having a good and open dialogue. David, tell us your view on being a male champion. Well, I think it's really important uh, to, to mentor. We have a program that we call Advantage All, which uh, we launched in, in 2017. And it's uh, a program that's really designed to make sure that uh, you know tennis is an equal sport for all. And I think that from a gender equality perspective, you know, we've set some targets as part of my being a UN um, he for she champion, 
we have to set uh, KPIs and, and targets that, that we strive for. And it's in the boardroom where we want to have a minimum of 30% uh, by uh, 2023 women on the board, 40% uh, on our committees and commissions, which we have. But when you look at tennis officials, when you look at coaches, we can do so much more. And if you don't set targets and if you don't strive for it, um, yesterday we had um, a, um, you know, a, a program called I Pledge and uh, where 53 of our national association presidents pledged to mentor and, you know, carry the ball as they should in helping to give more opportunities for, for talented women. So it's essential. It runs through our, our organization on the volunteer side, but also from a staff level where our senior staff, we've got 50% women, and it really helps our, our decision making. Mark? Uh, for me, it, uh, it's, it's kind of a combination of all these. My first job out of, out of college at Hofstra University, my alma mater, was run by a woman, uh, a lot of women in the department, and you're in a college environment where you know equity is obviously very important. And so that's just what I knew. I grew up in that environment. and. But I, what I've really learned through the years in terms of being a mentor is, is two important things is, is, you know, ask a lot of questions. Don't assume anything. You know, just be naturally curious, as, as Michael outlined. So I ask a lot of questions all the time. But that helps me understand someone's situation, male or female for that matter, uh, in terms of what makes them tick, what motivates them. And the other thing is, you know, as a leader, there's no throwaway comments. And, and that's something I really learned is that there's just no such thing as a throwaway comment. You might think it doesn't matter, but everything you say matters. And be, be, be very aware uh, and, and recognize that and be respectful of that. That's a, that's a really good point, Mark. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about the, the throwaway comment or an, an example of something that happened in a, a story or a, a comment that a female colleague made that you feel was a, a moment of reflection or that made you change or changed the way you thought about women in the workplace. Boy, you're coming in hot, huh? Put yeah, me on the sorry. spot. We did the, we did the fluff. <laughs> you the we door. did the fluff. <laughs> oh, um, you mean a comment I made or something well, that, I did? Well, not necessarily you, but I think, you know, we, and Michael, Michael and I know each other pretty well. I know that there, mm -hmm. there's some, some interactions you've had with females. It doesn't have to be a colleague, but things that have happened along your journey that have changed the way you thought about something. And, oh. and there's no, and this is a safe place, right? Like that's part of this is uh -huh. you, you are all male champions here already, but like it took, a, it took time to get to that. And I think what we'd like to share with our audience and also the men that are watching is it's okay to not be perfect as long as you're progressing the conversation. I, I, it's a part I, can, I can tell you, <laughs> it happened when I was about 12 years old with my mother. And I, and I still remember, it was a defining moment. I still remember it. it was, I grew up in western New York, snow all over the place, picked me up from basketball practice. And, and my mom had a job, and I was trying to understand what she did. And I couldn't, like, so what do you do? And, and I said a few words about her career and what she did that weren't flattering, and I didn't mean it. And I just didn't know. And, and, I, and I used the word just in front of what she was doing. You're just. And it was, a, and, and I still remember it to this day, it was the defining moment at that early age that there are no throwaway comments. Be conscious of what you say because it had an impact on her. And she came back to me and told me later that night, she said, you hurt my feelings with that. And here's why. And it was an incredible learning moment at a very young age of the impact of what you say matters and really asking questions and fully understanding before you make an evaluation, an assessment. And that, it was a defining moment, and I still remember it to this day. That's great. Anyone else want to share an anecdote? <laughs> it, it's a, I think being a leader today, you know, you, to, to your, you have to be conscious, very conscious of your words and your actions, even when you're seemingly feeling like you're doing the right thing. I'll give you a, a little bit of an example. Um, we're celebrating, you know, Women's History Month this month at the Celtics. We've got this great platform to do it. We're doing it during games. We're doing it programming all month. We have our, our all-staff meeting tomorrow where it's a women's takeover, so no men, just the women leaders of the company wow. and, and a bunch of people speaking on a variety of different topics. But So um, a couple of the women leaders approached me and said, hey, you know, we're going to do a women's photo on the court today. After we do it, would you mind you know, 
tweeting it out, you know, and it's, oh, of course, yeah, you know, I'm proud of the, the, the women leaders, the Celtics, et cetera. Then um, one of the women in the group said, you know, last month was, you know, Black History Month. Did we do the same thing during Black History Month? And I was like, we did a ton during Black History Month. We didn't do that. And, and I've sort of had a pause moment, you know, because I had to stop and say, well, how, how will that be perceived by, you know, our, our black staff, or, you know? And, and so everything is kind of a, um, th there's this great uh, responsibility with this awareness, right, of you have to think about everyone in your, you know, organization. All your stakeholders. And then if you're in sports, everyone from outside of your organization, uh, your actions, your words. And you have to think even sort of what seems like a good deed could have uh, an unintended consequence. And, and so I, I think, you know, it's, it's not a direct answer to the question, but it's what I've sort of, you know, coming to, to really learn and think more about is it's, it is about being thoughtful. It's about being aware. It's about, you know, making sure before you open your big mouth that you sort of have thought about what's about to come out and you've thought about how it's going to be received and who's receiving it. And... Uh, you know, and I, I think that's, it's not a trait that I grew up with seeing from male role models that, that I had um, because it wasn't something that was, was valued. That stuff wasn't seen as being critical to an organization's success. Uh, I think we all know now that it is. So did you tweet the photo? I did. <laughs> you know, and, and I, I think everybody was waiting for that, right? Yeah, Everyone I, wanted I, to know. I, I, I did, and you know, uh, I because it, it it was the right thing to do. But it's know, a great and, it's, it's a, a great point. example. To, yeah, it's yeah. a great example, and I I think that comes down to also the fear that comes with this responsibility of being a male champion, and I want to just say that to, to the men out there that it's okay to, not to you know it's also not a, we're all not perfect humans, right? So um, we all need corrections and, and guidance along the way, whether you're female or male. I think, you know, in our last, one of the earlier um, panels, someone talked about mentorship and um, women championing other women. And, and I think even someone mentioned it the other day that there's a cold place in hell for, <laughs> for women who do not support other women. And I'm just going to repeat that because it, it rings so true. Um, Madeline Albright said that, I guess. And um, you know, men have an enormous responsibility, but also this opportunity. And I think we should focus on the opportunity to make that change. And so tell me about being an agent of change. You're all at very senior levels in your organizations. David, you obviously in the ITF have a, a very big platform across men's and women's tennis. What is, what is it that, what can you do to be an agent of change? To me, I think part of it is not to accept unacceptable behavior. So I'll give you an example. Yesterday I was with um, uh, some presidents from different countries and, and we were talking about our gender equality program and what we're trying to do. And, Someone said, you know, one of my biggest problems is, um, you know, to attract women board members. They just don't want to be on, on the board and, uh, you know, they're not interested and they're busy. And I'd love to have somebody who could be on the board um, if they had the time. And, and I kind of sat there and said, boy, it's 2022. Uh, it's like saying, you know, uh, when your family comes in, uh, everybody should know that they should go sit at the table for dinner. Uh, when you haven't told them what time it was and what are we doing to go out and, and ask women to give them permission to say, I think that you're a really, really good individual. You could be a benefit to our board. I'd like you to consider standing for the board. I mean, it's, it's giving them the confidence and, and also inviting them to the club because sometimes in, in sports organizations, in, in federations, it's very male dominated. And, uh, and we've got to make sure that we don't accept unacceptable behavior or throw away comments uh, <laughs> that some people may make about how difficult it is. Let me, let me throw one thing. Look, I, I, I obviously live in this world, but I'm not in a team environment where there's mostly men, like I said. I mean, my boss is a woman, and I work with a lot of women. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's all around. And what I would say is this isn't like a, a – um, I don't find it as a dangerous space. I, I'm, and I'm not trying to pander, but it's like, I'm learning a lot. This is great for me. Like, I'm trying to do my job better. I'm trying to, we're gonna talk, I'm sure, in a little bit about working in women's sports and working with 
um, trying to do things differently. And so as much as sure, I, I'm embracing my role as, as best I can to, to help anybody. I mean, yes, we're obviously talking about women. I try to help anybody as best I can, but we're learning a ton, right? We're trying to, again, change the conversation. A big thing I always ask about is, are we talking differently? And I just mean everybody. Are we talking about race? Are we talking about every, you know, different human rights? Just we're now in a day where we weren't, however long ago you want to go back, that it's just a little bit more natural to just say, hey, can I ask about this? Can I... Can I get your thoughts on this? Whereas before, you just that wouldn't have been natural anyway from, from, I don't care if it's a man or a woman, just we just didn't really, right? You don't talk about religion. You don't talk about certain things. And now I feel we're doing that. And all I can say is, is, is it's, not, um, it's not like we walk to work every day, like, oh, my gosh, I hope I don't mess up. It's just like, hey, this is, this is going to be something we're trying to do. You know, the biggest thing I'm trying to always learn is, again, back in the, the, the vocabulary, just making sure you just ask, if we're working with women's you know, football, soccer, sorry, um, just how we talk about women, right? How do we, it's not they, it's not this. It's just, you know, here we're trying to do something. How can, how can we talk about it? And, um, but like I said, we're learning a ton. It's, it's exciting. I think all of our businesses need to grow from it. Um, so I take it as that more so than, uh, than just, you know, again, just trying to help everyone. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. I think, and, and you mentioned women's sports and championing women's sport. As a leader, as a male leader in sports organizations, how can we champion women's sports? Obviously, um, we talked a little bit earlier, Rich, about the 25-year history of the WNBA. And, um, you know, as a, obviously, you're a president of a male, a men's team, but how are you championing the women's side of the game, and tell me a little bit about how, how you can be doing both, but still commercializing men's basketball. Yeah, well, you know, we don't own a WNBA team, but I actually think that that's a good thing, because I think it's easier to be um, supportive um, when you're, you're not really thinking just about the, the bottom line, you know, um, and, and, you know, we've got a huge platform. The Celtics have 20 20 plus million social media followers globally, right? So anything we choose to, and you know, that doesn't even include our player followings, right? Uh, and, and so we've got a good opportunity to um, get on the right side of almost any subject, right? But in women's, um, you know, uh, empowerment in particular and shining light on that, I mentioned we had a, uh, a game this week where um, we celebrated women's history throughout the game. We featured... Um, Celtics, um, not just uh, basketball women executives, but business women executives who aren't public, you know, figures, right? People don't know who they are and their accomplishments and what they're doing. We had each of our players uh, get on the video boards during the game and put out through social media to talk about who their favorite WNBA player is, right? That they And not just who they like, but why, right? And talk about, like, what they like. So you have... Al Horford talking about why he admires Diana Taurasi so much because she's tough, she's a competitor. She's, and it's to, to me, it's sort of we can we can get those messages out with our platform, so we have a good opportunity to do it as long as we're conscious of it. So we go into Women's History Month, and it's like everything. It's well, every month is Women's History Month, right? It's not one month. It's sort of we look at it. And we we sort of say we have the saying, which is it's all twelve, right? All twelve months. And, uh, but, but we have a full month of programming, which is really internally focused stuff, outbound marketing, things we're doing in the community. We had a uh, panel the other day with Allison Feaster, who's our director of, uh, actually vice president of player development and organizational growth, and Ashley Battle, who's uh, an NBA scout, two of only 20 women in the league who have jobs in basketball operations. And they did a panel discussion with a bunch of uh, middle school age women about you know representation, identification, empowerment, and because they're the Boston Celtics, we they, they get listened to, right? And we have this opportunity. So, so anyway, we just really try to take advantage of that. Cross pollinate, yeah, great. Mark, how about you? I mean, you you're across both men's and women's lacrosse. Tell yeah, us we, a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, we're fortunate that we've got. Um, you know, a mandate that addresses both uh, men's and women's, boys and girls lacrosse. So we're very fortunate to, um, to have that position. You know, I learned very early in my career, I was working at Hofstra University and I was understanding Title IX as I went from being a student athlete to working as a, as a fundraiser for student athletics. And, and it was explained to me very well. And, and it's shaped my 
approach to women's sports since then. And, and, it, and it, the example was you got two people running a race. You got the men running the race and you got the women running the race. And the reality is they have started from different positions. The men have a head start. And so from a Title IX perspective, the, the, the push was really around being able to run that race at an equal pace, having the opportunity to do so with the right investments. But it doesn't end there. How do you bring them to be able to run the race or have the opportunity to run the race side by side at an equal pace? And so the only way to achieve that is to hold this team back or accelerate the growth of this team. And I never looked at it as a zero-sum game. I was like, well, first of all, you absolutely want to overinvest to bring the, that, the women's team, if you will, up to running that race side by side with the men. But don't hold the men back. And so I've always approached it from that perspective. It's not a zero-sum either or. But the challenge in reality is, is that you, the men's side of it, there's the unknown of are you going to hold back my opportunities by investing in, 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 in women's sport. And that reality or that perception is where the challenge lies. And, and from a, just being real, it, it does. And so I've never looked at it that way. I advocate not looking at it as a zero-sum game because it's just not good business. It's just not a good decision. It is about certainly investing so they have the opportunity to run the race side by side and maintaining that investment so they have the opportunity to, to both succeed, not an either or. And that's the way we approach it. Michael, your, your portfolio is stacked with women's mm -hmm. properties, mm -hmm. women's sports properties specifically. How do, you, how do you make the decisions to sponsor women's sports? Right. So the way we started it, um, we, if I were to bore you with MasterCard sponsorship strategy, you'd see we have these three tiers of platforms. And the top tier is our main ones we invest in. So that's baseball, golf, rugby, football, soccer. And, and um, I keep debating where to put tennis. Um, so we said, well, we sat down and basically said, okay, if we're in the men's side of the sport, are we equally in the women's side? And equal is obviously a debatable point, but if we were absent, and some we were, um, so we obviously had to address that. Absence, not good. Um, so we just started going property by property, and then you become, again, you just look through a different lens of what does it mean to be in the sport? So you take something like the Golf Open Championship, uh, the British Open, and the, well, there's the Women's Open Championship. Well. What, what can we do in both? You take tennis, right? So we have Naomi Osaka. Now, I would also say we put Naomi in a different category because she's basically Naomi Osaka, right? She's, a, she's just one of the greatest athletes on the planet. I, I don't kind of care anything other than that, that she's, now there's many things about her that are awesome, but that's where we started. We're in tennis. Um, who's a, who would be a great young talent that we could work with that's, uh, that told lots of, you know, that you know, really is a part of many great stories and um, she's awesome. And that was a, a few years ago. And that was just, um, I would say, knowing where she is, and we've all seen the numbers publicly, she's doing great, as, as she should, because tennis has many um, champions before her that she would say. I mean, obviously, Billie Jean King, the icon that she is, the equality of pay that's come with women's um, and men's tennis. So that, that's in a different category. That I'm not saying it doesn't need the brands to sponsor. It's just, it's just you look at it differently. And we would then partner with Naomi on what stories does she want to tell? Who is she as a person? How is she evolving now? She's going to be a business person. Um, Whereas you look at rugby, which we're in, that's a much that's a much um, you know further kind of down the line of evolution that needs to be supported. And we've been a, a, a you know good sized rugby sponsor for a while. Um, and then I guess I would say that the other part was you know another dynamic of the world unrelated to all of basically this conversation is how media has changed so much. Right? Uh, we all realize that athletes now in many forms are a media property, and so they have audiences they bring. They bring. Uh, their own brand, right? I, I, we talk about where some athletes are going. You know, I can't talk about publicly, but if you look back at, say, Michael Jordan and the, the icon that he clearly is, but if you look at it from a brand point of view, he was basically through the lens of Nike and Gatorade and, and how they, they brought him to life. Now, I'm sure he didn't just show up and do what he was told. I'm sure he was very interactive in that process, but that's changing a lot now, right? Um, the, the, when we sit down with ambassadors, or, or they have a lot more to say. They're much more, the world is just different now. Or they just go say it themselves. They don't need a brand, right? They're social media. They'll just say whatever they want to say about what they want. And if their brands want to play along, great. If not, they, they have this vehicle that didn't exist before. 
So we tended to gravitate toward working with a lot more of the female ambassadors because of all the other things we know about, which it's not there yet on the, the TV broadcast side. You, you know, I, I was laughing the other day when, when we're, um, I think it was Ali B was talking about, you know, how do you even find the sport? How do we even go, uh, there's events we're sponsoring, and I'm like, how do I find it so I can watch it? So until that gets better and better, um, we, we have these ambassadors we can also work with. So it's, I would basically say it's very complicated, but it also gets down to sort of where this sport is in its evolution. And then also do you decide to work with someone like Alex Scott, who is you know, an icon um, in many ways, who's kind of more well known, or do you work with some you know, more young up and coming and say, okay, as you grow and evolve, we're gonna be there with you and we wanna sort of help you um, as your brand grows, obviously I'm not gonna help you in your sport, but as your brand grows, how can we partner and bring you, bring you along if that's an appetite you might have? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You brought up Title IX and I wanna hit David with that because obviously I think Title IX and tennis are inextricably linked because of Billie Jean King. Um, what are you doing to celebrate this year? Yeah, well, well, a couple different things. Um, in, uh, in 2020, we renamed our women's competition. We have the Davis Cup, which is well known in men's competition, and we had the Federation Cup. And we decided that Billie Jean King, the icon that she is known for so many things, including Title IX, but you know, really, um, you know, equality for all is something that she stands for. So we renamed our women's team competition the Billie Jean King Cup, and and that made a, a huge, huge difference. I mean, tennis is very fortunate that um, at the at the highest levels, whether in the Olympics, uh, where we have mixed team competition as well as uh, individual competition, uh, men's and women's. Uh, the same thing uh, at the Grand Slam events and our team competitions. Men and women play side by side. There is equal prize money, so I think that you know we are able to celebrate that in in many different ways. There was a lot of celebration last year for the uh, the original nine, um, Billie Jean, and and the the other eight that really started women's professional tennis when they went to men's tennis and said we want to work together, and men said no no you go over there on your own own way, and uh, so they had to start their own women's tennis organization. So a lot of celebration for that last year as well. Um, as, as there should be. Yeah, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great segue, too, to the, the next question, because Virginia Slims was absolutely a huge part of that as a brand, and I think sometimes we overlook how important brands are in, in really driving cultural change. Mark, tell me about that. Do you have brands that are driving change for you and your organization? Uh, Nike has really been a big partner of ours in that process. Uh, Nike has really embraced our men's and women's national teams uh, in particular. And, you know, shameless plug for what we do have going on around Title IX, the World Lacrosse World Championships, uh, the Women's World Championships, rather, will be in Towson, Maryland, where the host country, 30 nations, will be coming in. And our women's team is phenomenal athletes, phenomenal human beings. Um, and Nike is a big part of that. Nike's been very um, intentional in their desire not only to maintain that relationship with those elite athletes, but how do we provide opportunity at the youth level? And they're driving that both for men and women uh, quite deliberately. So we're thrilled to have them as a partner. You saw you know, um, and heard from them earlier today in terms of their approach, and we're the beneficiary of that, uh, particularly on the women's side, but, but also the men's side and boys' side. It's great. It's really great. And, and you know, brands are so important to to making change, but I, I want to go back quickly to the media side because obviously many of us know the stat about 4% of media coverage in sports is is really focused on women. Um, but the reality is if we want women to be in the boardrooms, on the field, making the progress that we see here, you know, in this organization, how, how are we going to do that? How are we going to, how are brands going to influence that change in media? That's to anybody. <laughs> I, I tend to think, you know, cycles need to be broken a little bit. Um, you know, you can get, you know, you can say incrementally over time, you know, we, we all make progress and, you know, it goes from 4% to 8% to 20% at hope, you know, but the, I, I tend to think, I'll talk about the WNBA a little bit, of which I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert on anything, if that's not evident, but um, the, um, the WNBA is 25 years old. The, the NBA is 75 years old. So the men have been playing 50 years longer. Uh, they're the 
arguably the greatest athletes in the world. They're known globally. It's a huge platform. It's a good, strong business. Um, and that has actually probably made it harder for the women to break in because of the strength of the NBA. It sucks all the oxygen out of the room, right? Um, and for 25 years, the NBA has sort of been, uh, WNBA has been a bit of a battle, right, for profitability and to sort of run these businesses to, to make money so that you can pay players equitably and you can give them the comforts that the men enjoy. Um, and, and it's been hard to do because if you just look at it from a, a bottom line standpoint, you, you, it's hard to justify from a business standpoint. So if that's the only lens you're looking at it through, it's, it's tough, right? So you need, I look at it and I say you need different ways to, you know, whether that's a new owner who comes in and says, no, this is important to me, this isn't about the finances, this isn't about that, we've got to make the investment in order to get to the finances, right? Um, the WNBA has a, a fairly new uh, female commissioner. Um, she's got a business background. One of the things she's done, she did her assessment and everything, said we need to raise outside capital, right? And that's not really done much in sports, right? You don't say I'm gonna go out and, and raise private equity or venture capital. Uh, but I think she recognizes for the WNBA to get where they wanna go, there needs to be an infusion of investment that allows it to get to a level where now you, you sort of, you got something there, right? And, and so whether it's venture capital or it's people coming into sport who, who take it on as like, hey, this is, this is important to me and therefore I'm not gonna worry about the investment, which, you know, candidly, it, it happens in sport a lot. It, a lot of people say, I'm willing to lose money if we win, right? So, um, and, and that's how a lot of sports teams are run, you know? Um, so um, I, I sort of feel like you know, it's, it's, it's happening, um, but I, I think there's no, quick, there's no quick solution, right? I, I think this room is a good, you know, example of incremental progress, right? It's awareness, it's talking about it, it's making sure we're all cognizant of it, it's thinking about, you know, what we can do to, to change. I think there's one area, and anybody who knows me knows I don't rush to give properties credit, but I would make sure we give credit to many of the global properties that have made a decision uh, uh, that says, okay, we used to just throw in the women's game. You know, you sponsor the men's, and oh, by the way, the women's championships the next day, you know, if you're not too tired, it'd be great if you could come. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, literally, that's how it used to be, and I'm not going to call it who they are. Now, there's a very deliberate, if you're not interested in working with women, then just take the men's side, and we're going to go find brands that do. And you have to give them credit for taking that stand and for, for separating them out. And be, by the way, because there could be brands that have different missions. There could be brands that, that it's, it's it, again, it could, could be a number of reasons why it is that way, but they've separated them out and they're selling them differently. They're partnering differently. They're growing them differently. Um, they're, they're creating different platforms. They're finding issues that say, you know, this is an issue that we're going to talk about um, in, in a women's game. This is something, maternity leave. Right, that's the, that's the big one, right? So this, this is this is a specific issue around this. Uh, an athlete, you know, um, uh, uh, has to step away from the game, and so that is a big, I would say, a change that's happening that will accelerate um, this situation, uh, unlike some of the other things um, that have happened. And I would also just say given the credit for a lot of people that finally said, all right, this is the time, right? And, and unfortunately, I remember I was sitting on a panel somewhat like this pre-COVID. We haven't said that word, thankfully. But uh, that did, the, the women winning the World Cup was a big moment here in the US, another one, right? They've, but that, that, the NWSL, which we, we were uh, very excited to join, and I can tell you all the main partners that were on there, and I understand some change have happened, but I remember talking to Mitch, who I've known a long time, who comes from a very successful uh, you know, main sports background said, this, this is what we're doing here. This is how we're going to get it done. And you've got the Verizons and Ally Bank and Budweiser and sorry, I'm in a nationwide. But these are all brands like us that came in and said, no, this is something we care about. We want to work on this. We're going to invest in it. Uh, we don't have all the answers. We don't even know all the problems. But that was that, for example, was it was a moment. And I think there are more of those. Um, rugby has changed their language. There's no longer the Women's Rugby World Cup. They do it by year. So, of course, it's the 22 World, the 21 World Cups in 22, but it's this year, it's down in New Zealand, and that's where the women are playing. Next year is the 23 World Cup, and that's where the men are playing. So a lot of these things are happening, and it's allowing brands to come in and say, great, if that's where you're going to go and you care that much as well, 
then we can, we can design and staff and market and do creative around it. So I think, to your point, incremental is gonna happen, but these are times that are also happening that change will accelerate. Yeah, and, and that's a, an example of breaking the cycle, right? Exactly. All of these brands basically saying, okay, enough is enough, let's just go. We're not, we're not fearful, we're not scared to jump in head first. And, and it's, it's, good, it's good marketing. Let's face it, you know, every brand right now um, should be thinking about these things because it's what their consumers care about. You know, and, and being in you know, support of you know, women's empowerment, it's just, it, it's, it's sort of, you know, it, it's, it's not a hard decision. Someone just has to have the, the, you know, it has to occur to someone to say, let's, let's do this, right? Someone yeah. has to push the idea. And one of the things that I, you know, we have a, a, a couple of uh, women senior vice presidents at the Celtics who've been, you know, somewhat recently promoted into it. And the biggest thing I've been asking of them, and we, you know, every two weeks I meet one-on-one -on -one for an hour with each of them. And, and this was said before, it's, it's learning for me. It's like making sure I understand Right? But what I'm asking them for is <clears throat> empower yourself. Make sure you're advocating. Make sure you're pushing. Don't assume like, that, that I will know, that, I will, that this, this idea will occur to me. Right? Make sure you're making me aware. Make sure you're making the people around you aware. And I, I think no one, you know, most, most people anyway, don't want to you know, run around rattling cages all day. It's, you know, it can be stressful. So you have to know it's, it's okay, you know, bring it up, make, make us uncomfortable if we should be uncomfortable, you know, and don't assume, but don't assume the worst. Don't assume we're intentionally <laughs> doing this either. Just assume, you know, we, we haven't given it enough thought and we need, that's what we need from our, our, our female leadership. We need you to push us. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, oh, David, are you? Yeah, just, just uh, quickly, I think we made a strategic decision to really, you know, take the, the Billie Jean King Cup or women's competition and sell it and de-link it from the men's and to go after companies that had the same shared values, that wanted the same objectives. We have leadership programs and various things that we do around the competition, and we've had uh, quite a bit of success with about four companies that have signed on in, in the last year because of that focus, specific laser focus on, on women. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's interesting. We've, we've talked about women as ambassador, uh, sorry, male championing women um, in the workplace. We've talked a little bit about women's sports, um, but have we, we haven't talked about the, the female fan and what that means to, uh, to people. And I think one of the things that we as marketers need to remind ourselves of is that the, the female fan, whether it's for men's sport or women's sport, is so important to your bottom line, right? Um, Ann Karens, who is the vice chair of MasterCard, pointed out to us that 80, over 80% 80 of purchase decisions are made by the female in the household. How important is the female fan to you as um, a constituent or a stakeholder? Sorry, from, from my perspective, uh, the female uh, spectator is very, very important because, you know, many of our events are mixed events, men's and women's. And, you know, uh, it's about almost 50-50 uh, when it comes to spectators in, in stadium. But then when we, we look at viewership numbers, uh, women are a very, very big part of, uh, of the consumption of, of sport. How, how are you designing your experience, Mark? Rich, Michael, how are you designing your experience to welcome women? You know, from Fans. our perspective, you know, the women, um, as I said, you know, our women's senior um, national team, best in the world in terms of their skill set, but they're phenomenal human beings. So we're really, as, as we've talked about, you know, athletes, um, excuse me, fans often follow the athlete more than the team. So we've really tried to highlight the athlete. Um, how do we give those athletes a voice, do it in a way that's, you know, going to help them advance their brand and their, their objectives, not only on the field, but off the field, and what it means to be a national team athlete. So we've really set up moments where those national team athletes can interact with um, younger athletes, girls, uh, through the development program, but just in terms of being present at, at tournaments where we can showcase, a, you know, a, a red-blue scrimmage, if you will. 
and, and giving direct access to young girls that are players and parents for that matter to these national team athletes which are, who are incredibly dynamic. So that's certainly one thing that we're doing. The other thing that we're doing is actually we're, we're using data and insights. We've got to get better at that in terms of what, and, and a lot of this is known, but we're really digging into some specific research around what keeps a young lacrosse player playing, boy and girl, because there are differences. And whether it's mentorship, whether it's socioeconomic issues and barrier to entry, whether it's um, elements of the type of coaching, the type of experience, we want to really dig into some insight and research around what keeps that young girl playing the game of lacrosse from an initial experience and then keep them playing. And so that is a different language. It's a different approach than it might be for a boy and being smarter about how we approach that to ensure that girls have a great experience when they pick up a stick and they keep playing the game and have a lifelong experience with the game. Great. This is the danger zone. <laughs> it is, because there's the old phrase, it's important to measure. So sometimes we think whatever you can measure is important. And if you sit and ask, if somebody comes to me and says, what's the number one way to, to reach female sports fans in this country? It's the NFL. It's just the biggest. It's just the biggest audience. And if we keep going, LPJ, more women watch the PGA Tour than watch the LPJ Tour. You, we can't live by these numbers games. So this is probably, uh, not probably, the number one challenge I would say on the brand side and on the sports side is how do we absolutely break that cycle of saying no. If we're going to cause change, and it was said yesterday, one of the things we sat down and with our great consultants, Octagon, was we don't, how are we as MasterCard going to approach this space? We don't want to just show up, we're going to sponsor, it's great, we're going to do equality, we're going to do this, we're going to treat this sponsor the same, you know, this, this partner the same as that partner because that's how we, we bring things to market, but that's not going to cut it. So we talked about it, um, we're going to invest, we obviously have to spend money, we want to advise, and we want to advocate. And by that, that means sitting there, we sat there in the UK, and we sat there, you tell your TV partner, if they'll put the game, so Arsenal, the number one team in the UK, in a crazy mad football country, they tape the games, and then they'll figure out later, maybe you can, so you have to actually find it on tape delay. So it's like, no, you go tell your media partner that they will have sponsors, they will have people that will buy the media if they put it on broadcast. Like, it's, it's, that's where we all learn. And again, that's male, female. We all sit in these rooms like, wait, why isn't this working? What's the problem? Um, so the challenge is to, the fan is there, the, the, and in this case, women fans are there, but they're, they're the same victims any fan is. They're, if, it's not, if it's not available to watch, then we're, we're, we're all dead in the water. And so we've got to figure out a way to break that. I, I applaud CBS for getting on board and, and whoever pushed that and however that got done for the NWSL. Um, certainly high profile properties are, are on air as they should be, but there has to be more of it. Um, that's why I also think, and I loved hearing yesterday, this innovation idea. We just don't, let's just say, well, if we're gonna do this for women, let's just do it the men's way. I love that the one thing that was even said, I say, well, there's no even GMs, there's no this. Well, why should there be? Like, just because that's the way one sport worked. We're not gonna change and do something new and different um, if we don't try to change those rules. So we're trying to find those. We're trying to help create them. We're trying to jump up and down and scream and make them, make them happen as best we can. And it's, a lot of it's happening out there. And I think it's, it, there's, the roots are there and it's growing, but that, the number one danger is, is too focused on the fan because even a great brand will sit there and go, I just, I just don't know. I, just, I, I, I still have stockholders. I still have metrics. I, you know, they're, they're, the budgets are still You're a challenge. That's, that's just reality, and we all have to figure out a way. It's not a lack of interest or wanting to. It's just these are challenges that just have to be worked through. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point. I think the, the test and learn approach is always good, but also, you know, I think we can, we can understand brands that are in it to win it, right? We want those brands to do this for women's sports and also for our, our female um, colleagues around the sports industry. I want to turn it over to the audience to see if there's any questions for these amazing male um, champions. Hello. Good morning. Um, I just first want to say thank you. I have had many male champions. I think I've had more male champions than women champions, and that's for another topic, but... Um, <laughs> it's a numbers game. <laughs> I'd like to ask this question to my male allies is, you know, to me, this problem is not a difficult one. 
I'm a problem solver. We, 50% of the population is women. We could solve this problem tomorrow. And, you know, it's not coming to market with the vaccine that, you know, this amazing science world has, you know, given us, um, you know, they solved that problem and we're all able to sit here and be in this conversation. What do you see is, and, and one of those actually, one of the things that came out of the pandemic is women are leaving the workforce in droves. So it is a crisis. I'm getting older. I would like to see gender parity in my lifetime. As women, um, what, what can we do? And what are the you know, one or two things you think are most important in your organizations to change? You seem ready. Mark, Go. You ready? Okay. Um, what would I say? I would, I would say a couple things, and I don't want to put this on our our organization as a whole because I think our organization is doing an excellent job in terms of um, putting women in a position to lead. It's. I would say in general a couple things. I think that the investment that is coming into sport, women's sport in particular, is part of the solution. Right? Smart money means smart business decisions. And you referenced it earlier in that it's not hard. This isn't rocket science. And I've always looked at it quite pragmatically and almost dumbfounded to the point like, it's just good business. Like, it's just good business when you build a high-performing team. And I learned this in my NFL days. It, and, and some people don't equate Jets with high performance, but let me just <laughs> put that one on the side. But I learned this in my NFL days, and Bill Parcells, as a great leader of people, was, was, was great at it. You bring people into your organization that bring different values. They bring different, um, they serve different purposes. And so I've always looked at it through that lens is that you need someone who's the, you know, the one who's really intense. You need the social conscious person in the group. You need the comic relief in the, in the group, right? You need the, the, the person who's going to, you know, be the intellect. Well, that comes in different genders and races and bodies. And that's how you build a high-performing team because that's who your consumer is. And so it's a long way of saying is I've encouraged people on my team, women in particular, men, just have a voice. Speak up. Don't assume that I know. Like, and you said, like, tell me what I need to know, not, not what you think I want to know because that's the only way that I can help. And, but I know that doesn't come easy. Right? For some people, women and men, using your voice is hard. It's a challenge. It's not where you're used to. So I, I would encourage people just like we and I am comfortable being uncomfortable. That's my message. Be comfortable being uncomfortable because that's going to allow you hopefully to use your voice in a way that's going to drive solutions. So, you know, we, we have a, uh, in team sports, a demanding environment um, with regard to you've got, you've got a regular business week that, you know, business people experience. Then you have sometimes three, four game nights, weekends, Sundays. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a challenge. And I can only imagine if you were like um, a working mom, how much harder it must be. And, and it's one of those things that I've always been aware of. I've, I've got children. I understand, you know, the demands, you know, that both moms and dads have. But, you know, candidly, it's, it's, it's mainly moms. And, um, and, you know, we're during this pandemic, um, it was kind of killing me to close the office. It was kind of killing me. And we, even when we got back into the hybrid mode, and uh, and I was just like, yeah, I can't feel it. Like I can't feel our culture when we're remote. And sports and what we do is so much about the Celtics family and the culture and all like this whole vibe you get that would make you choose to work for us versus working someplace. So I'm like, that that's getting killed. At the same time, I had a great conversation with one of our female leaders. Um, on Zoom from my basement and her, you know, Dining her, room, yeah. yeah, her office. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I said, how you doing? You holding up all right? Is this going, you know? She's like, you know what, Rich? This has really been good for me. She's like, I can be the mom I want to be and I can have the career I want to have. And I was like, yeah, okay. You know, and, and I, I got to say, I was an advocate. Like, I want to get back. I want people, I want to feel it, you know? And, uh, but I'm like, nah, we're not going to go back fully. Because just the notion of being able to give, you know, our women, and not just our women, our men too, but that, that's sort of like, okay, I can, I can have both. Um, you know, that's worth sort of sacrificing some level of what we would consider the way we used to do things, our culture. But, 
you know, point being, it's sort of like a, okay, we have a, you know, I, I would worry otherwise that we're going to lose the women we work with because they're going to do, you know, the great resignation. They're going to say, you know what, I can get a job where I don't need to work nights and weekends and I can be around more and I've gotten used to being around more with my family and I want that. So I want to, you know, we want to be able to allow people to do that. So it's, you know, it's not a full answer to your question, but it's sort of a, a piece, you know. Little piece. I guess I think two things. Where's my jersey? Um, is... First of all, there's a little bit of every we just we have to just be the best versions of ourselves, right? And so some of us are introverted, some of us are not, some of us joke around so however it is. But I would say in whatever capacity, um, uh, just I don't know, stop asking for permission. And I say that to all of us. You know, I saw Annika up there now, and I were we we had a half a deal, basically half the deal we have with Annika. I was like, why don't we do more? And we're like, I don't know, let's just do it. And we just called her up. She's like, sure. And and I mean, forty percent of girls playing in LPJ, women playing in LPJ events came through her girls program. I didn't know that, right? So it's just, we kind of stopped asking permission. We'll just do it. Who's really going to get in trouble? I know I'm saying this on camera, but if you really went and did a little bit more with women, are you really going to get in trouble? Like, who, do I really think I'm going to get fired if I spend more money on women's sports? Um, I, have to, ears, I have to play, I know, I have to play by the rules, and you have to live within the confines of the system you're in, but I don't know, that's just, and, and, I don't know, I don't, it's to your point, that's not overcomplicated. Let's try to sit down, and again, the people that have come to us, that I sit there and go, what are you trying to do, what is it? Okay, great, let's just try to figure it out. And I guess the other one too is, and this is for, this. I'm taking a personal pet peeve I have of internally, people at MasterCard kind of participate and, and, and uh, go to different events based on what they personally like. I sit there and go, well, you work at this company, whether I love rugby or not, I, I appreciate it, I don't love it, that's part of our job, we gotta go. Um, I would say whether we all personally are like something, if it's if it's the right thing, like look, wait, is it public yet about the? No. The, really? No. Okay. Which thing? The, the championship this year. It's in the press release. Oh, whatever. No. Okay. So the, when events, big events happen. We could do a, a skit. When big it. events happen, whether like the women's rugby here. They're rap. They want to rap. I know. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Is let's get out and support it. Like get, go go and whether you like the WNBA or not, just go. You know, if you, if you, if the Angel City, look, that's going to be this, you know, it's going to be held up in a lot of different ways. Just, just support them anyway. I mean, unless you have your local team, your support is great. But, but just, let's just get on board and figure out a way to, whatever that means, get the jerseys, like be a fan and don't just talk about why it isn't what a certain way, then be a fan, you know, and maybe you'll learn to like the sport in a way you never did. Uh, watch the girls play, the women play golf and just say, well, what a challenge are they overcoming? Danielle Kang's awesome. Follow her. Pick, pick somebody. But I guess I would just say, let's 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 all live the life that we think other people that we want them to leave. Let's just do it first, and then a crowd draws a crowd, so they'll get there eventually. Let's go watch the Great lacrosse. Points. Great we'll points. Get a thousand. Yeah. So <laughs> quick quick wrap. Quick wrap. Thank you, uh, David, for telling us to invite someone to the board. I think that's a really good point. The invitation matters, not just the quota, but the invitation to the board. Um, no throwaway comments. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll all be uh, all invitation to the World Championships at, in Towson in June. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Rich, for breaking us, the idea of breaking the cycle. I think that's great. And Michael, invest, advise, advocate. We're here for women as, as male champions and also on the field of play. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.